Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Planning for Changes in the Archives, 12 Steps for Undertaking Collection Relocation with Scott Patol. My name is Hathaway Hester, and I am the co-chair of the Midwest Archives Conference Education Committee. Normally, the Education Committee plans in-person workshops that are held in conjunction with the MAC annual meeting, but this year we had to do things differently. And so we have shifted our focus to webinars instead. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items and ground rules for the webinar. One, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing by the end of this week. Also, we will address any questions at the end of the presentation. To submit a question, please use the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice that the webinar also has a chat feature enabled, which will allow you to make comments and share relevant information with your colleagues. Please feel free to make use of the chat throughout the webinar to respectfully engage with one another, but try to direct your questions to the Q&A. That way we'll be more likely to see it. And one final note before I introduce our presenter, expectations for conduct. By participating in this webinar, you agree to engage respectfully with the presenter, hosts, and other webinar participants. Any type of harassing or disruptive behavior is prohibited, including but not limited to abusive or derogatory comments, slurs, or epithets, threats or acts of violence, intimidation, misgendering, or excessive comments not pertinent to the topic at hand. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, and if anyone engages in harassing or disruptive behavior, that person will be removed. All right, and thank you all for answering the poll question. Uh, I think we have our results, looks like, surprise, uh, most people are from an academic institution, but we have some hearty representation from nonprofits, corporate organizations, and government agencies as well. Thank you. All right. And finally, I would like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar. Scott Patol is a certified archivist who serves as library services solutions architect and subject matter expert at Iron Mountain. In this role, he works closely with archivists and librarians to provide strategies for enhancing collection and content management with innovative moving, innovative moving storage and digitization solutions. Prior to Iron Mountain, Scott was the assistant professor and university archivist at the University of Illinois at Chicago where he managed the university archives and records management functions. Before UIC, Scott managed the corporate archives, corporate museum, and records management program at the Pampered Chef, a Berkshire Hathaway company. He is a member of the Academy of Certified Archivists, American Library Association, Society of American Archivists, Midwest Archives Conference, and Chicago Area Archivists. His leadership roles include SAA Business Archive Section Chair, MAX 2018 Local Arrangement Committee Member and Reception Chair, and the inaugural Chicago Area Archivist Steering Committee Vice Chair. Scott received his Master's of Library and Information Science from Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois. Welcome, Scott. I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Hathaway. And I will get the slides launched here. All right. So um, it's great to be a part of the uh, Mac webinar series. My name is Scott Patol, and uh, I've been an archivist for 15 years. But recently, in the past uh, year and a half, I transitioned over to Iron Mountain. Uh, to be a part of their library services team. Uh, this position makes full use of my, my archival experience and, and then some. So, but you might be thinking, um, isn't Iron Mountain a records management company? Well, that's true. Iron Mountain did start as a records management company, but over the years they've 
branched out into many other areas, including data centers, cloud services, digital transformation, art handling and storage, and library services. And that last group is where I fit in. I use my archival skills and the experience I had working in a university library uh, in my role on the library services team. The team includes archivists and librarians who work with archivists and librarians in need of solutions for moving, storing, and digitizing archival materials. We uh, serve as a bridge for knowledge transfer between those who need our services uh, to Iron Mountain and then from Iron Mountain back to archivists and librarians. So today we're going to talk about uh, 12 steps for planning uh, for a collection relocation. While there are common elements to moving archival materials, as we'll discuss, it's not possible to use a cookie cutter approach to do that move. Just as your collections are different from other archives collections, there are also many other differences like your standard practices and procedures. There are differences in how you, your collections are used. And there are differences in uh, your facility that are going to make your collection move very unique. It's useful to take time to plan for the move, at least as much as you can. There are often external forces driving how you're going to be moving. So you want to make sure to plan now and that you think about the possibilities while you're moving. Yes, the, the details will change and you'll update your plan many times before you actually have to move, but they will give you a framework once that move comes. And to that end, there are 12 steps to moving archival collections you'll want to consider for your plan. And these steps really apply no matter what the size of your archives is. You'll want to at least think through each step before you decide to skip a step altogether. Before we get into the 12 steps, let's talk about the process of moving and how that makes you feel. Maybe you're excited because your collections are moving into what will be a state-of-the-art facility. Or maybe you're not thrilled at all because the move is being required by circumstances that are well beyond your control. Or maybe this, the conditions are not ideal. And most likely you're probably somewhere in between those two extremes. But there will be highs and lows in each project. And whatever the situation, moving your collections can cause you anxiety. And that's natural. But to combat that, uh, make sure that you take care of yourself. You want to try to uh, get enough sleep, uh, eat right, make time to exercise, all those things that you, you're told to do in, uh, anyway. Make sure you're, you're doing those during a move. Um, meditate, if that's something you're into. You'll feel better and be better equipped to tackle your project if you're taking care of yourself. And another thing you can do to help reduce that anxiety is to come up with a plan. So here are the 12 steps to moving a collection that we'll be talking about today. And these steps can be grouped into four categories. First, planning and communication, where you're going to lay the groundwork for the move. This includes engaging the right resources, determining the best practices for your move, taking the time to figure out the timing for your project, and communicating about your move. Next, you'll move on to identifying and documenting, where you're defining the characteristics of your facility and your collections. Start with your facility to determine the impact it will have on your move. Then document the materials that you'll be moving and note the condition issues in the collection so that you can minimize the impact that the move will have on any at-risk items. The next group is just one step, and we did that purposely to highlight the importance of tracking. It's so important to make sure that you are tracking your materials in a way that will help you figure out where you've moved the collection to. You wanna be sure that you have good control over your collection while it moves. 
because you want to be able to assemble it on the other side of the move. And lastly, are the steps about anticipating, where you'll be thinking about how the move will go and the what if situations that you could encounter. You'll look at exceptions during the move and how those are handled. The logistics required for the move, there needs to be a, a plan, whether it's a move within the building to another building or to an offsite location. And you wanna figure out the supplies you'll need and get those ordered as soon as possible once you get a green light for the project and determining what the backup plan will be. It's always helpful to have a method to deal with those unforeseen issues. The efforts to put, the, the effort that you put in in this portion of the plan will help you in the long run and it might just, just save your, your um, whole project. So put a little time into determining how you're going to deal with, with uh, those last minute changes. These steps are the final leg of the preparing to move. You want to make sure you're ready to, to go and, and have prepared as much as you can because there will always be those unforeseen items. So you want to expect them. So let's go back to the beginning and start with the first category, planning and communication. And we'll work our way through this category. First up is First up is resources. Who's going to be involved in this project? Most likely there are folks you'll want to enlist as part of your team. There should be at least a specific point person for this project, um, a, a project manager, and maybe, maybe that's gonna be you, but maybe there's somebody on your staff uh, who would be good in this position. There needs to be at least someone who's assigned to the task of keeping everything in order and keeping the project moving. There are a lot of moving parts to, a, to this uh, relocation project. So you want to make sure that all those parts are being tracked and driven to completion. Is there a, a facilities person in your building or in the larger organization? You wanna make sure that that person is your best friend. They can be helpful, they can offer advice, and they can have ideas that will save you time and money. And on the flip side, this person can also be a huge impediment to the move. So do whatever you can now to make sure that that person is your ally. If your project is off in the distance, you might start now working on being friendly to that person um, because they are definitely going to impact how your project goes. Don't overlook any allied skills that you might need, like someone with marketing background or communication skills. Marketing people can help you uh, with the project by letting the general public and your staff know about how the project will be progressing. And we'll take a look more of this when we get down to the communications plan. If your organization uses volunteers, think about uh, what their skills are. And if you have someone who has project management or logistics background, they might be able to help you uh, with this project. They could take an, uh, it, uh, an, a lead and put together a project plan for you. They may not have deep archival skills, but the access to someone with good organization skills uh, and the ability to organize a project will really help keep your project moving but you wanna make sure you assess, assess their uh, commitment. They are a volunteer after all, so you don't wanna give them more responsibility than they can handle or, or might be willing to take. And then you have to think about who will actually do the move, whether that's gonna be staff or students or volunteers, or maybe you bring in a vendor. Think about this at the beginning of your project. Where is the actual moving labor going to be coming from? And best practices. Do you know someone who's moved a collection before? It never hurts to reach out to your peers and use your personal network. One of your contacts may have moved similar collections or had a moving need similar to what you're going to be needing. Reach out to your contacts through listservs, uh, 
and find out if there's anyone out there who can help you either locally, regionally, or nationally. In general, you know, archivists are a very friendly, helpful bunch of people. So make use of that experience and go out there and, and see who can help you with your project. An additional benefit uh, to talking with your contacts is they can warn you about things that went wrong for them, any kind of pitfalls that you wanna make sure that you avoid. So be sure when you're asking them about the project, make sure to talk about what went wrong. Uh, you've already made the contact with, with them about best practices. So uh, make sure you mind that uh, the depths of that contact by getting both sides of their experience. And don't overlook your vendors. Vendors know someone who can, may know someone who can help you with your, your, with your best practices. And that vendor may be someone who does best practices. So a vendor can help you uh, think about the move and they might uh, approach the project with a totally different take than you might have on it. So reach out to your vendors. Um, even if your project is going to require a request for proposal, a vendor can help you in the early stages shape the project. Uh, it's interesting, you know, when you get a request for proposal, oftentimes they don't ask the questions in the, in the RFP uh, that are really vital to the pro project. Sometimes they miss those crucial elements. So you want to make sure you, you talk it through with someone first. So you can talk to your vendors. Even if you don't think you can use an external company for a move, they may be able to provide you with that perspective you need to help define your project. Then think about the timing. Timing is crucial to the success of the MOVE project. Think uh, through the entire timeline and, and put that timeline together. You want to start at a high level with a broad list of steps uh, that can make the project work and then work backwards from that end date. Uh, if you don't have an absolute end date, pick one and work from there and you can always move your dates later. If you're planning early enough, you'll be able to include some cushion in the project at the end and between each of the phases. That contingency time can be extremely helpful once the project is running and you're faced with an issue about your collections or the facility. Or maybe something goes wrong, like one of your elevators breaks down. Contingency time will be crucial to figure out an alternative. I worked on a library project where the loan elevator was out of service for the duration of the project. And that's a problem you don't want to have, but it can be overcome with some thought and the right methods. So you can't count on everything running smoothly 100% of the time. There always can be a time killer in there in your project, but building in some contingency time is the best way to combat that. At this stage, you'll be estimating the length of time for each stage at a high level. But later, you'll want to actually flesh out the timeline with more accurate estimates. The difficulty in estimating the timings really comes from the fact that you may not have moved a collection before. So here's a tip for figuring that out. Perform activities that you'll use during the move and have someone time you. Actually, go into the stacks and break this uh, activity down uh, so you're uh, getting down to the fine pieces of each each activity then multiply that by the units that make up your collection that way that'll give you a better idea of how long the various parts of your project could take and you can add up the time for all the parts to get a fuller picture of the overall project and for example time pulling one box off the shelf and putting that box on a cart Take that time for that action, multiply it by the number of boxes in your collection, and that'll, that'll give you an idea of how long it's gonna take you to get all those off the shelf. Um, or, you know, take a cart, a full cart, and move it from your location uh, in your stacks to the new location and figure out how many cart loads you'll be taking. And don't forget to add in extra time should you have to use the public elevator and need to wait for the elevators to arrive. And be sure to double the time to account for the time of coming back. And also add some extra time to include the time that you're gonna be putting the items on the shelf. If you think about it, you can come up with a general estimate of how long the project 
might take. But you always want to account for extra time. There will be tasks that take longer than you planned or annoying roadblocks along the way that you'll need to be dealing with. So communications. There are something that often gets overlooked. Something that often gets overlooked during a, a move is the communications plan. You want to uh, make sure that you're uh, covering all of those possible um, needs you have to communicate what's going to be happening in your plan. And make sure you're including those both to your staff and to your patients, patrons. The staff needs to know uh, what's happening with the project. But it's important to also get that word out to researchers. So take some time to put together an actual plan. For that internal communication, you want to make sure that you're covering the items that they're going to be interested in and they're going to be worried about. Um, let them know about changes in their work hours and, and, and what's going to be expected from the staff. Uh, talk about changes in the type of work that they'll be doing during the move. Let them know the steps of the plan and, and, and how that will progress. Um, also, how each person will be involved. Also, the timing of the project uh, would be helpful to let them know uh, so that they can get an idea of, of how long they will be involved. And then there's always maybe temporary policies and procedures that are around the move. So let everyone know internally uh, how the move is going to progress. Externally, you need to make sure your researchers are aware of your plans because may may come in and, and want to use your collection. Now, the great thing uh, that we've probably learned over this past year is how to communicate with our patrons. And that's great. That's the information you want to continue to use. Um, you want to let them know how the move impacts their ability to, to come in and access the collections. You want to let them know if there are planned closings or altered hours, because the last thing you want is that person to show up uh, and be wanting to use a collection when you're closed. Let them know how they can get information from the collections if they're closed, if that's something that's possible. And also let them know about any alternate locations. Some uh, archives while moving will set up another location uh, where some of their collections will be available. So if that's the case, make sure it's clear. Always communicate early and often should you uh, should the archives be closing for a period of time. Of course, uh, be sure to include information on your website, your media, social media feeds, uh, send out press releases. And if you're in academic uh, archives, include your campus newspaper and, and or the campus news website. Uh, post signs well in advance so people know who are in the building. And post messages on dig digital screens. Like in an academic environment, you can post messages on the wallpaper of the computers throughout the building. And for corporate archives, you can post messages on the intranet. So there's places you can put information to let make sure that people are, are know. And here's a tip. Involve your marketing person to put together your communications plan. And if you're on an academic campus and don't have access to a marketing person, you might be able to get a marketing student to create your communications plan as either a project for a class or as a student worker. So communications is, is important and oftentimes it's an afterthought. So be sure upfront to give some thought to how you're gonna be communicating about this entire project. So the next group of steps can be categorized as identifying and documenting. This is where you put in some definition around what you're moving and, and how it gets moved. First, you'll want to look at your facility and determine 
what's unique about this building. Uh, I'm sure you've been on tours, uh, archives tours in the past. Um, there's something that's very popular. Um, people enjoy going in and seeing what other archivists are doing and other archives, uh, what type of facilities they have. And, and they try to learn uh, from that any kind of information that might be helpful in their own environment. So um, the facility is something that is very uh, important to think about. There are quirky details about, about each environment that you want to take in, into consideration. Um, you want to do a thorough assessment of the facility so you can identify any necessary arrangement that you're going to need to make before moving the materials, either from your building or within the building. You want to be sure to consider the elevators and how many carts they can hold. If they're public or staff only, uh, if there's what, what are the differences, uh, the distances between storage locations in the building or storage locations in separate buildings. You want to think about the paths to get through the building uh, in the most efficient way. Also, uh, think about the climate and humidity control in the rooms where you're going to be needing to use for storage. You may want the current and new environments to be similar, but sometimes that's just not the case. You'll need to think about how long you can store your materials in the environment that you're putting them in. And also what impact that's going to have on your, on your collection. It's also good to think about alternative storage plans in case your first uh, thought falls through and you need to, to scramble to find something else. Think about what challenges your facility poses for a move. For example, I once worked in an archive where the, the basement was a split level and the storage rooms were on different levels. So when you took the lone elevator to uh, three of the storage rooms, um, that was the only way to, to, to get collections in and out of that space. And that elevator was down for a considerable period of time, uh, most of a year actually. So we had to figure out how to maneuver through that environment. But think if you're actually going to be doing a move and your elevator broke and you couldn't get in and out, how would you handle that? What would you do as a backup plan? There has to be a way. Um, sometimes, uh, your move is, is something that's being required of you by uh, the, the large organization. And so you're gonna have to, to bend to that plan when possible. So if you're moving your collections offsite completely to another building, you wanna figure out how the materials are, are being moved from the building uh, to the different locations on the, in the building and how that will impact the timing of the move. It will take longer to move materials through the public elevator. And it will take longer to move materials if you're on the fourth floor than if you're on the first floor. So, and things out of the basement will take a little bit more time. So think about how you get those things out. Um, how the egress of the building will happen. And do you have a dock or are you just taking things out of ground level doorway? If the materials are coming out of the building at the ground level, You'll need a truck with a lift gate that can handle fully loaded carts. But if you have a dock, does the dock have a dock plate? And does that dock plate actually work? And if the dock is a standard height, uh, is it the height of the trucks that you'll be using? Uh, or will you need to adjust for that? And how would you solve the problem if there is no accessible way out of the building? You want to think about are there times the dock will not be available, like during other deliveries and, and when the docks are, dock is occupied? And are there restricted times on that dock? So there are plenty of things you can think about when you're moving materials out of the building and, and come up with a plan for how to deal with those. Identifying what materials will be moving and how you're going to choose those materials is an important part of the process. When identifying the materials to move, it's not really helpful to think about your collection as one big group of things that you're going to be having to move. Instead, you want to break it down into manageable chunks 
that you can plan for specifically. You also don't want to think traditionally about your collections if you're moving, especially to another building. Um, you want to think about um, your collections as materials, the materials that they are. Uh, so instead of counting the entire collection, collection by collection, counting how many boxes are in those collections, you'll want to think about the types of boxes. So you count overall in your entire archives how many standard letter doc boxes you're, you have. You want to count how many standard um, legal doc boxes you have as another type. And you want to count the half size letter boxes and the half size doc boxes as two more types. Think about the record storage boxes and the large flats and the small flats and go on on through all your entire collection and and, and determine uh, all those different types of materials. It'll help you plan uh, when you're moving if you think about them as material types because that's the most efficient way to move them. Um, moving things that are like size are more efficient than moving uh, a whole uh, pallet of things that, are, that don't fit together. So it'll help you if you think about each type of material to move. The move requirements for different types of materials, is something you want to figure out ahead of time. And, and then you can be prepared to move those materials in the way that's most efficient for each one. When moving each material type as a group, you'll still want to be aware of the collections they come from, clearly, um, because you're going to have to reassemble your collections. But um, of course, you know, if you have a more advanced systems, uh, tracking systems software, that should be able to help you uh, with keeping track of your collections. And, and maybe your collections aren't stored together. Um, maybe they are broken up by type, so that's really helpful as well. So be careful and make sure that you're capturing these, these different types of materials, uh, listing them all out uh, so that you have something to work with. You'll also wanna spend some time identifying which materials have condition issues and document those issues. Be sure to flag those so that the people who are actually handling those materials know to take some extra care with them. It's helpful if you, uh, if your archives information management application can actually print out a report of condition issues. That's that's a great tool. Then you can go through and flag all those boxes. Um, otherwise, you'll have to have someone go through the collection and determine where those collection issues might fall. Some issues can be rectified uh, or mediated, but others will need to be just stabilized for their protection during the move. Either way, materials with condition issues are common in archives. So some of the basic issues you want to deal with before you move are document boxes with weakened or broken hinges, boxes with missing labels, record storage boxes with torn handles, rare books where the binding is partially or completely separated from the book, uh, any red rot uh, or paper deterioration, and of course, the conditions of, of the items themselves. Moving archival materials with an issue will cause them uh, plenty of physical stress. So the temporary changes in temperature and humidity levels are going to be practically unavoidable as you're moving out of the building. Remember, too, that the vibration of the carts and the pallets can cause some stress on your materials as well. So deal with those conditions and issues up front if possible. It's better than waiting until after they've moved. Make some time for reboxing document boxes with hinge issues and storage boxes with broken handles. Relabel those boxes with missing labels. Tackling the fixable issues before a move is always preferable to, than letting, to, to letting them go until later. For example, unlabeled boxes have a greater chance of being misplaced during a move. Then once a box is misplaced, it might as well not exist until you do a next full inventory of the collection. So it takes some time up front. Of course, the timing of the move could make it 
nearly impossible to deal with these fixable condition issue issue condition issues. So it's at least helpful to at least record that information, make sure you have it noted so you can be aware and pay attention while you're moving. The goal is to make sure the move doesn't compromise the materials uh, through an excessive amount of stress. The next category includes only one step and that's tracking. We put it here in one step so you'll be able to um, think about it a little more clearly and realize that its importance. You want to determine how you're going to track your materials during the move. It's helpful if your materials are processed consistently, fully inventoried and barcoded, but that's not going to always be the case. This process is somewhat dependent on the systems you use to track your, your collections. Maybe you use an access database, which is actually helpful if you have access uh, skills and access that can help you create reports and meta and the, and the metadata exists within the um, within it the, the database. On the other hand, you could have a sophisticated archives information management application that doesn't have a great report writer. That provides some difficulty in getting the information you need for tracking. And you may just be using an, a, an Excel spreadsheet or a Sheets document. Those can all be made to work for tracking your, your, your collections. A current inventory is the most valuable tool uh, for tracking the collections. So if, if you have one, that's a great place to start. Information that's captured about each box and then uh, becomes useful for determining uh, what's happening with your move. Your paper and, and, and PDF finding aids are not as helpful because they require a lot of uh, massaging to get that information into a usable form that can pr provide you with an inventory tool. If you're moving materials offsite, we recommend barcoding each box if that's not already been done. If you want uh, to use the barcodes in a future tracking system, they should be placed neatly on the front of the box and the label should be straight and in a consistent location. But if you don't have plans to use the barcodes after the move, they can be placed in another location, either on the back end of the box, uh, which is a good usable position and, and they keep from cluttering up the boxes uh, on the side that we facing your shelf. Um, you could also uh, place them in other locations, like for document boxes that will be moving off site. You can think about applying a barcode to the top. That way those boxes can be scanned once they're overboxed uh, and are ready to move. That will, uh, putting them in an over the box will definitely protect that hinge on a document box from any stress. Either way, the barcodes provide a convenient way to track and scan your materials while they're moving through your building or to an offsite vendor. If you're planning to apply barcodes for your move, consider using RFID barcodes. RFID barcodes will enable you to perform quick and accurate inventories in the future by running scanning equipment up and down, up and down your aisles. Um, so think ahead, if that's something you have to do, you have to apply barcodes, think about those RFID codes. Of course, there are other methods than barcodes to track your boxes. But when you're moving off site, barcodes are going to be the most secure method. Also think about the consistency of the past processing, because that's an important factor in tracking. Changes in procedures over time should be documented. So it's possible to determine uh, possible to keep track of which boxes adhere to which versions of the procedures. Where, while this is, um, uh, adds a level of complexity to the tracking process, documenting that information will be useful going forward. And it's those unprocessed collections that are partic particularly difficult to track. We recommend you use some type of system, maybe a barcode, to track those items. And that way you can make sure when the move is done, that you know that you've moved all of these unprocessed items. And it will help 
also when you're trying to determine what needs to be processed. So the next category, the final category, is anticipating the, the changes before the project begins. We'll look first at exceptions. The key with special cases in your collection is to document your plan for dealing with those items as you come across them. You may be aware of exceptions that are processed or are literally hanging around the archives in some out of the way storage location, but have a method to deal with exceptions in a, in a somewhat uniform manner so you can simplify the process going forward. The method to handle, handle exceptions needs to be broad enough to deal with <clears throat> many different types of items and yet specific enough to capture the unique information. Then there are the considerations for how the exceptions will be packed and move. One of my potential customers plans to gather all the exceptions in his office during the renovation, and that certainly works. Other exceptions like antique furniture and artwork uh, require special art handling skills and logistics that you'll need to plan for. The solutions uh, for the exceptions should be broad but the key is to document how you're going to uh, apply those exceptions to the things that need to be handled. Be sure to include whose job it will be to resolve those problems and questions when they arise. Logistics. The key to logistics is planning. You'll want to develop step-by-step -step workflows that outline the order of operations for each material type in the move. The workflows provide a specific set of instructions for handling those materials. Think of logistics as a recipe for a move. Each step is dependent upon the completion of the preceding step. If you're doing a smaller move by yourself, the workflow captures your thoughts about the moving process and provides a reminder when the actual day arrives. And for a larger move, the workflow provides a roadmap for everyone involved in the project. The steps should be detailed enough that anyone you hand the workflow to will be able to complete the task. However, you don't want the workflow to be overly detailed and difficult to grasp. Writing a good workflow is part art and part skill that you can develop with some practice. It can be helpful to, to take a laptop into the storage room and, and document each step as you're doing it. Using that method will make sure that the workflow you come up with will be practical. Complexity is not the goal of the workflow. You want to shoot for simplicity. Simplicity with enough detail so that it's clear. That will help the person doing the move. It's always good to have someone you trust read through your workflow and give you feedback. If you're willing, if they're willing, they might come into the storage room with you and walk through the workflow. That will save you the time from going back and fixing mistakes uh, of someone who misinterpreted the workflow. And when you moving an entire collection, a small mistake repeated over and over again can quickly become a huge problem. Of course, you can always account for, you can't always account for the reading comprehension level of your team. So you wanna make sure that you do some training and walk through the workflow with the people who are actually going to be doing the moving. If you can demonstrate in the aisle what the actual items uh, that are being moved uh, with the actual items that are being moved, you'll definitely reap the benefits of your planning work. You'll also be able to see whether people have questions or problems and quickly go back and wordsmith your workflow to make it as clear as possible. Supplies, you'll want to create a list of supplies that you're going to need throughout the moving project. Even though this might happen at the end of the, near the end of the 12 steps, you really wanna keep a list, running list in your project notebook all along so you can keep track of the supplies you're going to need to order. If your uh, list is ready earlier than, the, than, than this step, go ahead and, and order once your project has a green light and you're ready to go. Uh, some things have a long lead time so you want to make sure you capture those items and get them ordered in time that they can arrive for your project. 
some useful items that you might not think of during a move uh, are supplies that you need. Uh, and you know, this depends upon your facility, but think about your temporary floor protection, like Ramboard that comes in a roll or Masonite that comes in sheets. And then there's edge tape that will hold that uh, floor protection down that provides a quick release from the floor, but it's tough enough to hold the materials securely. Also corner guards for door jams. You can get those uh, either it's cardboard or foam and tape them to the jams. Another thing to think about is exam grade latex free powder free nitrile gloves. You could use cotton gloves, but they get filthy during a move. Nitrile gloves are cheap and disposable and you can replace them off with, often to keep from getting the boxes dirty. And then we're at the backup plan. Determine what, uh, what process you'll use to deal with those unforeseen challenges that inevitably pop up during the move. You can plan for these issues so that when they arise, you have a method to deal with them. Think about how to resolve an issue. If you need to get approval for a solution, who you need to notify and what resources you need to marshal. Uh, also, how much does the solution cost? You'll also want to create alternative plans to think about what might happen during the move and, and create backup plans. It never hurts to have a plan B and a plan C, just in case there's a block that keeps you from moving forward. So those are the 12 steps that we discussed. They're arranged in categories of planning and communications, identifying and documenting, tracking and anticipating. My suggestion is to start planning early. As soon as you have an inkling that you might need to move. Sure, it may take years before the move and your plan may change many, many times. But my experience tells me that once you get a green light, the project is going to move very fast. So plan now for your archives move. The time you spend in planning is well worth it. Thank you, Scott. We do have a few questions. Okay. And I'll read you the questions uh, and then you can respond. I'd like to encourage all attendees that do have questions, please add them to the Q&A this time. All right, so our first question is, what suggestions do you have for safely and efficiently moving maps and other large flat items normally stored in flat files and map cases? Flat files and map cases can be a difficult thing to move and it really depends on how far they're moving. If you're moving them within a, in a building and within the same floor, it's simple enough to um, take out each drawer and move the cases separately and, and reload the drawers. But if you're going to different floors, you have the issue of getting the, the drawers through the doorway. It means you're going to have to uh, turn them sideways. So you either want to unload the drawer uh, and put them into um, boxes that are nearly the same size as the drawer. Or another option is we have a kit at Iron Mountain that we use that uh, provides uh, pressure against each drawer to keep everything in the drawer in place. And we will um, take out the drawers from one section of a map case uh, apply these lids to them, flip them on their side and move them out, then move the actual physical uh, case itself and reload them uh, either in the truck to move them somewhere else or in another floor. So that's probably the best way to go about it is to, is to um, come up with a method that's going to keep the materials snugly in that drawer. Thank you. Um, our next question is, I need to move an archive down three floors in a building with no elevator. We have a booklet that serves only two of the three floors. So no matter what, we will be moving hundreds of records cartons one at a time by hand. 
Do you have any suggestions for our situation? I do. Um, one of the best ways in that situation is to um, employ a human chain. That way uh, you don't have the people doing the moving going up and down an entire staircase. They might be going up and down a few stairs. Um, when they're moving the boxes, they need to hand them one to another uh, and they have to make sure that they're keeping the boxes level when they're carrying them. Um, so it takes a little bit of discipline, uh, but you get a team, they can move boxes down the stairs, uh, down a set of stairs very quickly that way and, and safely. Uh, they're handling one box at a time so um, you don't have to worry about about uh, you know them uh, dropping the boxes and and losing the contents so one box at a time and keep them level and that chain can bring those boxes down that stairs and then you put them into a cart or a, another box all right and our next question I'm digitizing access copies of materials that are moving off site. Any suggestions about tracking individual files to the box it's stored in, which may not physically match up with the way it used to be stored on the shelf? Yes, one of the ways that you can do that is to use a naming convention that incorporates uh, the same information that's in your finding aid. So the the, the series and, and the um, the folder uh, that it came from and then numbers within a series of the, uh, the box and the folder and then the numbers within within those folders. Um, then it way everything will be numbered exactly the way it lays in the collection. And you can always go back to your collection uh, and say this item came from this box because it's numbered exactly the same way. Um, that's a good simple solution for keeping those things in order. Okay, and we've had a couple questions about your slides and would you be willing to make them available after the presentation? Sure. Yeah, I can make them available. Okay. Should you, uh, is there somewhere that we can post those on, on the Mac site? We'll figure it out. Okay, or yeah, or I can just email them either way. <laughs> either way. Or people can email me too. Yes. Okay, um, and are there sample plans available online that can be used to help plan a move? You know, I, I actually looked for sample plans just to see if there were, and I didn't, I didn't see anything specific. Um, and generally, it's only so good, as good as, as the sample. I mean, every move will be different. Uh, your collection is unique and, and your situation with your building is always unique. Um, so you can only plan so much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we almost made it. Um, you can only plan so much. You can only you can only like generalize so much. There, there's so much custom work that's done in putting together a moving plan that it's not really helpful. Uh, other than the broad framework, uh, it's not really helpful to to have a plan that someone else uh, developed because it's it's going to be specific. Okay, and. That's, that's it so far. Oh, here, we've got another one. What is the best way to move newspaper boxes? How many should be stacked when moving? Newspaper boxes, um, you'll generally want to not stack those uh, too high. So um, I would say I wouldn't stack them any higher than they stack on your shelves. So that would be a good rule of thumb. Uh, when you move those, you can move them on carts, uh, you may not have um, carts in your facility. You may have to rent carts to get carts that fit properly. Um, sometimes archival carts um, aren't the aren't the best for those materials because sometimes the, the, they won't fit. Um, but carts are, are a good way to go. Um, if you're going a long distance, uh, you would palletize those. And again, I would keep them 
to the height of they, they are in their shelf, usually probably three or, or four high, depending on the, the height of each box. Uh, but you have to realize those larger boxes don't have any support in the center really. And so you wanna make sure not to take them too high. Um, so yeah, that, those, that's, those are the, the, probably the ways that I would move them. If it was going a distance, it would be on a, be on a, on a, on a um, pallet, but not very tall. Okay. And um, another one here, how could we best approach collections that are currently being processed, um, possibly not appropriately named or identified during a project? Yeah, those, those are difficult. Um, and I think you've got to come up with a way that you can at, at least a, a, uh, identify things so that once you move them, you understand what they are. If that's coming up with a some type of scheme to give everything a temporary name, that might be a, a way to go. Um, you know, if, if there are things that haven't been dealt with at all and, it, and they're gonna have to be um, processed in the future in some ways, um, the order on those don't, don't matter so much because they've not been dealt with yet. And you're going to have to um, think about that when you process those collections anyway. So I would say just make sure that you um, do some type of tagging or, or labeling where you can number all the items so that you make sure that what you took out from the location is what you end up with on the other end. You've got the same number of boxes and everything has moved. And this is sort of on a similar note. Um, besides barcoding boxes, do you have any additional suggestions for moving a collection that has little to no intellectual control? Yeah, you you could um, again number the boxes. Uh, some um, sometimes you can, depending on how where you're moving, if you're moving them within a building or an, or, or a nearby building, it's not so bad. You could put. Um, labels on them, just slips of paper uh, fastened with a, a, um, a paper clip on, on, the, lay, on the top uh, lid of a box, attach those. Uh, the only problem with things that are paper clip is they have a tendency to come off during the move somewhere along the way. Some of them, something will lose a, a tag. So that's the reason uh, that, that you want to avoid that method if, if you can if you can barcode or or put some kind of a, a label on the box, um, but I understand that there's a lot of reasons why you don't wouldn't want to do that. So sometimes tagging them with with um, slips of paper that are numbered can, to keep them all in order would be a best best practice to go with. Okay, and uh, we're getting into a bit of a legal question here, so. Um, just a warning, uh, we're moving to a building across the city. Should I be concerned about insurance? That's a very good question. Um, insurance, uh, you know, you definitely want to, to make sure that there's is, is some type, I, really every organization is a little different. Um, some organizations uh, don't are large enough that they don't insure anything. Uh, they, they insure everything themselves. Um, other organizations are, are smaller and you might want to think about that, but it's going to be hard to put a value on your collections. I mean, really, basically they're one of a kind um, individual things and you want to have the things more than you want to have the money for them. So insurance, while it's probably a, a not a bad idea if you're moving things yourself or, or having a mover move them, um, it will be difficult to value. Um, and that's something that I, I, I've not dealt with myself, but I, I, I can imagine it would be difficult to get, get a good uh, valuation of your, of your collections and something that would be valuable, something that would return what you needed from them. Okay, and uh, just one more question, um, building upon an earlier question about uh, sample plans. Um, this person asked, might a plan be developed by an institution 
um, that could be made available as a template to the community, um, which is a great idea. And I guess I'm curious if you have ever come across something like that, Scott. I haven't come across that, but that would be, a, a, I think, a great idea. That would be a good, um, I think, a good project for for a, 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 an archives group to come up with is a, a plan, uh, a plan for moving that, uh, you know, just a, a broad template. Um, I think that's something that would be very helpful, but with a, with a caveat that it's going to require plenty of customization because I've not seen two moves that are alike. Okay, and that is all the questions we have and we're at time. So okay. um, thank you very much, Scott. Thank you everyone who attended today. Um, we will be sending out a short survey to all registrants shortly. Please do take a few minutes to fill it out. It will help inform our future programming. And finally, I would like to take a brief moment to let you know that Mac's annual meeting is coming up in just over a month on May 13th and 14th. It will be fully virtual. And for more information, check out the upcoming meetings page at midwestarchives.org. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thanks again, Scott, for sharing your expertise. Thank you.